Dear friends, this is Bishop Daniel Thomas of the Diocese of Toledo. Please join me now in praying together our diocesan prayer. Heavenly Father, with the redeeming cross of Christ Jesus, your Son, and the gifts of your Holy Spirit, renew and strengthen us, so that by our prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, we may foster holy disciples, holy families, and holy vocations, so as to become a more holy diocese of Toledo. We turn to Our Lady, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, for her intercession and never-failing prayers. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Annunciation Radio presents Faith Alive. Highlighting the many ways Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo provides love and support for those in need. And now, your host for Faith Alive, Executive Director of Catholic Charities in Toledo, Rodney Schuster. Hello and welcome to Faith Alive, the program that shares how the love of Jesus Christ is provided through the ministries of Catholic Charities throughout the Diocese of Toledo. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, Executive Director for Catholic Charities, and today we are devoting our entire program to the upcoming vote on Issue 1. Uh, for those of you who are listening, I'm hoping and praying that you've seen the video from Bishop Thomas, you've seen his op-ed piece, you've participated in the 40 Days for Life Midpoint Rally, which was this past Saturday, that you truly, as Bishop encouraged in his video, to read this amendment on Issue 1. Uh, it would be devastating to life, devastating to parents, devastating to people. As Bishop shared in his op-ed piece with the Blade, this is a human issue, and we need to get out. We need to make a difference because, uh, my friends, uh, this is a serious attack on life, on parents, uh, uh, the unborn, um, and it just would be devastating. So today we've got three great guests that are going to talk about this issue. First, we're going to have Kevin Jory, who's the director for the Office for Life and Justice for Catholic Charities, uh, Allison Stump, who's the Catholic Charity Students for Life coordinator, and we're going to wrap up the program with the last segment with Savannah Martin, who's the executive director for the, the Bella Vida Network, which includes the Toledo Pregnancy Center, uh, Soul Purpose, and the Haven, uh, all to focus on this important matter. And uh, I can't stress it enough, uh, folks. Uh, you have to get out and vote on this and vote no. So first up, uh, we're going to welcome uh, a familiar voice uh, to uh, Faith Alive, Kevin Jory. Thank you for having me, Rodney. We're just one week away from the most crucial vote in Ohio history, so there's no better time to be talking about this than exactly this point. So, Kevin, when you came on board with Catholic Charities, so, you know, a little, little more than a year and a half ago, did you ever envision that you would be devoting so much time and effort, as well as your team, to an issue like this in the state of Ohio? Never. No. I, I started Ash Wednesday, uh, last year, and three months after I began, Roe v. Wade was overturned, something that the pro-life community has been struggling against for the last 50 years. And I, I had only really even just become pro-life in the last five years. So I used to be on the other side of this argument as well. So I can completely understand, if you only hear one side of the argument, why you could be pro-choice, as some people say, or, or pro-abortion like I was too. But it, as soon as you go through the arguments, you understand that you know life is worthy of dignity and respect, and we, we need to honor that. And so, no, I had no idea that um, we'd be fighting the battle of our lives uh, in Ohio. And, I mean, truly, at least in my case, I don't know about, about everyone else's, but, I mean, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called, mm -hmm. and he's giving us strength. He's giving us grace, and he is here. So if we fight the battle, he will grant the victory. And, Kevin, what are some of the things that you're hearing that might be a, an area of confusion for some people who may be like, well, I don't, I don't know what I should vote here, yes or no. Uh, what are some of the points of confusion that maybe people, uh, don't understand about this, uh, amendment and how can we clarify it? 
to make sure people understand. Of course, we encourage everybody to read it so they can get firsthand. But what are some of the things that you're encountering? Yeah, just from my own viewing uh, of the the supporters of issue one, which we need to vote no, we're against it, just to be very clear. But for the supporters of this, um, they've stated things I even saw yesterday on social media, how this would somehow strengthen parental rights. Oh. And they tried to give some arguments for it, and they just fall flat because this year in Ohio, we're facing issue one. But last year in Michigan, they were facing Prop 3, Proposal 3. And so we don't have to guess what they mean by this vague language. We can really just look to our neighbors to the north. And in a joint document that the ACLU of Michigan and Planned Parenthood of Michigan said, this is just this previous June, they said, we must repeal Michigan's outdated parental consent law. So they're just outright lying about parental consent. So if you see anything like that, just know that the same people who have brought issue one to here in Ohio, the same people that did it in Michigan, they're saying what they really mean in Michigan, and they're lying to get something passed here in Ohio. So really, they, they can line their own pocketbooks because this is a billion dollar a year industry, and they're trying to make more money. Another one that is just really insidious because, I mean, one, the Catholic Church just does such great work for women and families who have suffered through this is this this idea that this will somehow protect miscarriage care. Yeah. And no one protects miscarriage care like the Catholic Church does, even right here in the Diocese of Toledo. Uh, specifically within, within our office, we have the Zelly Ministry, which uh, Laura Range heads up. And that's, you know, we provide uh, conversations. We, you know, we go and get coffee with families that have, have dealt with this. We provide free resources. So uh, right here, you know, I'm a person who we help uh, you know, families who've, who've dealt with miscarriage. Also, Sufficient Grace Ministries, just a beautiful apostolate, um, from our Protestant brothers and sisters that go into hospitals right when the miscarriage has happened and they, they knit, you know, beautiful little outfits for these babies. So, and they do remembrance photography. So, I mean, on that front, we care for the babies who have already passed away and the families who are still going through it. But also, I mean, we just had 30 Catholic hospitals in Ohio sign a letter stating that they will always provide comprehensive miscarriage care regardless of the outcome of issue one. We have pro-life OBGYNs who we just had a couple weeks weeks ago, uh, Dr. Christina Francis from APLOG, the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs, say that we are leading leading the way on miscarriage mm-hmm. care. And just lastly, uh, a woman who suffered a miscarriage care while we still had the heartbeat law, um, she was getting care from a Catholic hospital, from a pro-life OBGYN, and it was while the heartbeat law was in effect, which we don't have at this moment and even then uh you know much to the chagrin of of the supporters of issue one she got care she got love she got resources and she's out there telling telling people about this too so just one of the most insidious lies is that miscarriage care will go away or that this somehow protects it it's just patently false you listen to faith alive and our guest is kevin jury the director for the office for life and justice in the diocese of toledo and we're talking about the upcoming vote on november 7th and we're saying vote no uh, on issue one, and just want to make sure that's clear. And I know Kevin, the Office for Life, has been very busy. I know we're going to hear from Allison Stump in the in the next segment, but share some of the things that you've been involved with. And of course, uh, it is an ending. Uh, we've got, I mean, we had the midpoint rally on on Saturday for the forty days for life. Uh, we've got a mass coming up on November sixth at twelve oh five. PM at St. Francis. So share a little bit about what you have been doing and still what's yet to be done. Yes. And, and while all of this is going on, um, the, the biggest thing I want to invite everyone to is just to pray the 54 day rosary novena that all of the bishops in Ohio are trying to unite people around. Um, you can just go to pray 54 ohio.org to get all the information on that. And even if you're starting late, start. Just get started. Um, we're doing 20 push-ups for life, uh, usually every year. Uh, in Ohio, we have got 20,000 abortions. This previous, uh, 2022, we had 18 and a half thousand. And those are just lives, lives lost to, to the evil of abortion. So do some push-ups, especially men. I'm trying to get them involved too. We need to have some fun while we're battling against this great evil too. Um, yeah, this previous Saturday, we had our Mass for Life and we had our Eucharistic procession that Bishop Thomas led the way on. He's been leading the way from day one on this too. We're so blessed to have such a strong and bold Bishop just speak out against this great evil. And like he said too, it's not a political issue if you're worried about that. You know, it's not a religious issue. It's, it's not an 
individual issue even. It's really a human issue. It's a human yeah. rights issue, which he is exhorting all of us to, to really dive into. Um, we are ending with our 40 Days for Life closing prayer rally. That'll be this upcoming Sunday, Sunday, November 5th. And we were going to have it at 10 a.m., but one of the moms that we're helping, her baby's getting baptized that, that oh morning. My. So we're pushing it back. So if you've heard 10 a.m., it's going to be 10.40 a.m. for a rosary, <laughs> and then we'll start at 11 a.m. Um, sign up at ToledoRespectLife.com, ToledoRespectLife.com for our email updates so you make sure that you get the most up-to-date information so you can join us for that. And then, like, like you s- said too, Rodney, we've got on November 6th, at 12.05 p.m. at St. Francis in Toledo, Bishop Thomas says, again, he is leading a, a mass to defeat issue one. This is the day before the vote, and we all need to go there, too. So everyone in the diocese is is invited to this. So if you're listening, you are invited. So come out this upcoming Monday, November 6th at 12.05 p.m. And if you can't find parking, you can park right at the Diocesan Pastoral Center. We'll walk right over with you, too. So um, these are just some of the bigger events that we're doing. You know, we're going to parishes. We're going to Knights of Columbus meetings. We're going to schools, as you'll hear later with Allison. We're door knocking. We're phone banking. So anything that you can imagine we are doing that. And Bishop Thomas is getting involved in all of this too. And he has been involved this whole time too. So, you know, watch the videos, uh, read his leading the flock article that it's probably, uh, in your most recent bulletin for mass. So just get involved, get informed and then inform everyone around you. Yeah. You're listening to Faith Alive and our guest is Kevin Jory, who is the director for the Office for Life and Justice. And, you know, Kevin, I think it's telling as well. This, uh, how drastic and tragic this issue would be if it passes because you're hearing from the Blade editorial board, the Cleveland Plain Dealer editorial board, often which, um, aren't, um, you know, presenting things from a Catholic perspective for sure, but even, you know, in a way that, uh, kind of you know, pushes the line a little bit. They're saying that this goes much too far and would be devastating. I mean, what does it mean, especially from your background and where you came from, that you're hearing and seeing that in entities that otherwise may not support some of the work that we're doing? We talk to people every day that would themselves identify as pro-choice, and they're coming out and saying that this is just too radical, too extreme for them. And like you mentioned, the Toledo Blade, in that article that they put out, they openly state that they support abortion. These yeah. are abortion supporting people and this is still too radical for them. So what this would do, so let's just paint a picture of what could happen if issue one passes. Painful late term abortions throughout all nine months of pregnancy for any reason, even for minors, even without parental consent. Some abuser could take, you know, a 14 year old girl to an abortion center and then they would not be responsible for notifying the parents. The parents would have no idea. And this just really perpetuates a culture of death. We're trying to build up the culture of life. We're trying to say, women, you can be moms. The abortion industry is trying to say you're too weak to do that. And we know that that's just not true. So women are able to do these things. And we're here to step uh, just right beside them every step of the way. It's not a political issue. It's not a religious issue. It's a human issue. And just one other thing is that If you just go and read issue one, it's less than a page. You'll see it never says the words woman. It never says mother. It never says adult. It never says child and it never says baby. These are dehumanizing types of words that they're using in issue one where we're just trying to say, let's build up a culture of life. Let's be there for moms. Let's be there for children and let's really support them. So if issue one passes, this is what you can expect. But we have a razor thin margin. And we have made up so much ground, even though we're being outspent, but, and, and we, we have to educate people. They're just trying to push the lies. But what we're saying is issue one is just too radical. It's too extreme. It's going to provide painful late term abortions throughout all nine months of pregnancy. And truly, even if you identify as pro-choice, if you're listening to this and you, you aren't fully pro-life, that's okay. Issue one is still too radical for you and we need your help. We need your contact. Everyone in, in your phone book, uh, if people still have those, maybe your contacts list in your phone, <laughs> but contact everyone and really we're one week away. So when you, when you get to November 7th, you know, hopefully you've already voted early, but that day, make sure that you're calling everyone you know, 
Um, help us call people the day of. We're going to be working round the clock the day of, um, calling people, trying to exhort people to get out there. You can go to volunteer.createdequal.org to go ahead and, and get signed up with phone banking as well. We'll just provide you everything. You can do it from the comfort of your own home, and we can really uh, just invite everyone to vote no against this radical extreme issue one. Kevin, we've got about 30 seconds left. What are some things that are coming out that people can in, get involved with? Yeah, get involved. So pray at the abortion center, the last remaining one uh, in Toledo at uh, 1160 West Sylvania Avenue. We've got our closing prayer rally this Sunday, November 5th, 1040 Rosary and 11 a.m. rally. Get involved. Tell everyone you know. And let's fight to defeat issue one. Amen. Amen. Kevin, thank you so much for uh, your engagement and your involvement in this. Uh, continue prayers for protection for you and your family. And as, as Kevin has just shared, uh, get out and vote. Uh, that is our right, our duty. Get out and vote uh, November 7th and vote no for issue one. No in November for issue one. Kevin, thanks so much for being with us. God bless. We're going to head to break, but stay tuned for this week's Social Justice in the Bible with Peter Sibelio. We'll be right back. Hello again, everybody. Peter Sibelio here from Lord's University. Each week we look at the Bible and do it justice. Social justice. In other words, how do our ancient scriptures give us marching orders in Toledo today? Today, we're getting ready for Election Day in Ohio in Issue 1. After that, it will be on to the holidays. In that spirit, let's look at the beginning of our Christmas story and the beginning of our New Testament with the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers. And that all sounds easy, but it wasn't. It took a lot of faith in God and a lot of God's faith and patience with us. Remember, Abram was 75 years old before the Lord called him. He just traveled with his extended family, and now God sends him out on foot again. God promises that he will become a nation and that all nations of the earth will find blessing in him. But again, he's 75. His wife is 65, and she is barren. Dun, dun, dun. Of course, neither of them are even called Abraham and Sarah yet. So when God does give them these names and promises them a child of their own, they fall over laughing. By then, Sarah is 90. Abraham is 100. Yet one year later, Sarah has given birth to Isaac. She invites everyone to share in her laughter. Abraham and Sarah are now laughing with joy, and so they name their son Laughter, which in Hebrew is Isaac. And they all lived happily ever after. Not Abraham must pass God's promise on to Isaac and his children. But Isaac's wife, Rebecca, is, you guessed it, barren. So she prays and prays and prays for children. When an angel grants her wish, she becomes pregnant with twins. But the twins hate each other so much, they fight in her belly to see who can come out first. Esau wins with Jacob holding on to his heel. But wait, how does Jacob inherit the family blessing and the fame of being called Israel? Jacob and his mother Rebekah cheat Esau out of it. And sure enough, when Jacob goes to have children, his favored wife Rachel is dun, 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 barren. And because of Rachel's rivalry with Jacob's other wife Leah and their concubines, Jacob ends up with 12 sons and one daughter. But since their mothers were rivals, the brothers become rivals too. And that ends up getting the whole family enslaved in Egypt. But Yahweh saved them from Egypt. And for the first time in the whole Bible, Israel calls Yahweh Savior. That is how Matthew begins our Christmas story. That is how he begins Jesus' story. And that is how he begins our story of salvation. Jesus saves but God works that out through family. Jesus' family, our families, and our family of faith, the church. Life is hard. Raising children and honoring parents is never easy. But God didn't choose perfect families. He chose imperfect families to perfect his salvation through them. And that means us. And that means no on issue 
one. Issue one reverses our story of salvation. It cancels Christmas, at least the real meaning of it. Abraham and Sarah, you folks are old. Just retire and settle down. Joseph, you need to divorce Mary. Just move on. And Mary, my dear, you are an unwed mother. Don't ruin your life. Get rid of that child. That is what issue one would say to them. And if it passes, we are saying that to them too. If I announce that some wicked people are sure to die, and you fail to tell them to change their ways, the Lord says to Ezekiel, then they will die in their sins, but I will hold you responsible for their deaths. Well, that is what God is saying to us about issue one as well. If it passes, we didn't do enough. Since our opponents have trouble with identification issues, we can hope they just identify with voting on November 8th, 9th, and 10th. But we must vote on November 7th, and we must bring friends. That's our homework this week. Find someone who isn't voting and get her to vote. Find someone who wants to vote and get him to the polls. And let's all vote no on one. What a way to do justice to our scriptures, to do justice with Jesus, and to keep the preborn and our faith alive. Hello, everyone. Bishop Daniel Thomas here of the Diocese of Toledo. Just wanted to share with you my statement regarding issue number one being placed on the November 7th ballot this fall. The inclusion of issue one for a vote on the November 7th ballot should alarm us all because of its profound disregard for human life, for the health and safety of women, and for the rights of parents. Make no mistake. This amendment would not only enshrine abortion into the Ohio Constitution, but take it to its furthest extreme by placing women at risk in an unregulated abortion environment, undermining the right of parents to know if their young children are having abortions or medical treatments contrary to their beliefs, and permitting late-term abortions of babies, even up to birth. This horrific amendment should compel all of us to reject it on the grounds of its complete disrespect for human life, its disrespect for the women of Ohio, its disrespect for parents and their rights, and its disrespect for babies about to be born. I hope, pray, and encourage all people to vote no on issue one on November 7th. Now, back to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster, Executive Director of Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo. Welcome back to Faith Alive. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, Executive Director for Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Toledo. And again, we are focusing our entire program today on uh, voting no on issue one which will be happening next week, Tuesday, November 7th. So please, please, please get out and vote. Our next guest is Allison Stump, a familiar voice on uh, Faith Alive. She's the Catholic Charity Students for Life Coordinator. Allison, welcome back. Good morning, Rodney. Thank you. So, Allison, what have you been doing and what are you hearing from, you know, folks that you've been meeting with for, from students, from our younger population? What's their perspective of what this issue is? And, and of course, I know you've been out there at the forefront, but what are some of the things that you've been doing to help either bring clarity or correction if people don't really know what this is about? Right. So every day uh, for the last couple of years, my job has been to just provide clarity and light and education, mentorship, formation to students of all ages uh, to help build a culture of life and just ensure that no woman ever has to walk alone in her pregnancy and to help build up our fellow our, our men in, in the world too to be responsible fathers and men of God, you know, God willing, make people ready for heaven. So that has just shifted as we've gone into this, you know, this great battle for the defeat of issue one. Uh, so I've been really just trying to activate the grassroots of Northwest Ohio, serving my students, helping provide them the information, the tools, hopefully a little bit of the courage they need to step up and stand in the gap um, for these souls that are just at such a risk 
uh, families that are at risk um, losing their rights uh, with the passing of, of issue one. Please, God, we can defeat it, bring him a victory. Um, but what we're doing is we're doing a lot of uh, advocacy on college campuses. We're doing door to door campaigns. We're doing phone banking. Anything you can think of, we've probably done it several times just in the last couple of months. Um, just trying to get people excited and help keep the fires going. Just, you know, I think oftentimes we use the image of that, you know, this little light of mine, the candle that's burning, things like that. But I was, I was really inspired by a recent talk, um, by the brothers that spoke at, um, I, were you at it, Rodney, by the, the Benefit for Life with Foundation for Life? Um, the Benham brothers, I think yeah. their names were. They said something that was really inspiring to me. They said, instead of a candle, you know, when the wind comes, the candle gets bur- blown out, right? Yeah. But instead, when the wind blows on a coal, the fire gets hotter. It yeah. burns brighter and deeper. So I'm just trying to get those coals burning. Um, it takes a little bit to start, of course, but trying to get that, that flame and that, you know, that, that real furnace of the pro-life movement, this post-row generation really activated so that we can, you know, keep things going for the next seven or eight days, however many it is, uh, to, to just cooperate as those unprofitable servants to bring God's victory. You're listening to Faith Alive and our guest is Allison Stump, the, uh, Students for Life coordinator for Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Toledo. Allison, what are some things that you've been hearing from uh, our our folks, our younger folks, uh, that may that that they might be confused about what issue one's about, or maybe even misperceptions. What are some of the things that you're hearing? Um, and you know, again, and what are we doing to bring the truth of uh, what we're hearing? First and foremost, a lot of people, not just students, still think we're talking about the August special election, which has been a couple of months ago now. So I'm very happy to just provide that easy point of clarity that it's it was also called issue one, but we're facing a completely different beast right now that would have helped our cause if we had passed issue one. But now that that's passed uh, or beyond us, rather, we are fighting a completely different proposed amendment to Ohio's constitution that would, you know, put our our state at risk and totally change the outlook and culture of our our community here. Um, So that's one of the biggest things. But I would say on college campuses, especially, there's a fear that if um, issue one does not pass, there would be a total bor- uh, total ban on abortion the wow. day of, right? Which is simply not the case. Um, and I, I heard the recording with um, with Kevin earlier about fears of miscarriage care not being available or no care for ectopic pregnancies, things like that. Um, these are the, the these are the fears that students have, um, feeling like their rights would somehow be compromised if issue one fails, which is simply not the case. So I just try to speak hope and um, truth into that conversation, just sharing with them that miscarriage care has never, um, never been better. It's never been more accessible. Um, ectopic pregnancy care has never been, been considered an abortion by the Catholic faith or really any good doctor, <laughs> for that matter. Any good OBGYN is going to see a pregnant mother and recognize that he or she has at least two patients that they have a responsibility to protect. Um, you know, like you could have more with multiples, of course. Um, but just sharing that any good doctor is going to do everything medically possible to preserve all the lives in his or her care. Um, so I think that helps a lot of people recognizing that, you know, while I would love to see all abortion go away yesterday, right? Yes. That's simply just not the reality here in Ohio. And even if the heartbeat law is passed the heartbeat law, like every other abortion restriction in the United States, allows for exceptions for rape and incest, which breaks my heart still because those lives also matter. But abortion will still be accessible in Ohio, regardless of the outcome. It's just the matter of how far are these students willing to push it right now? Um, we, we live in a culture where we have the freedom to have conversations about how we want to regulate abortion, uh, regulate the health and safety pr- uh, standards for women seeking out those abortions. But if issue one passes, those conversations would be taken away from us. We would no longer have the right to argue things out like this in our legislative system, to have these fruitful dialogues and really talk about where everybody stands on this issue, because that right would be taken away. It would become a constitutional amendment that would not change for the rest of our lives. Our guest is Allison Stump, the Catholic Charity Students for Life coordinator. And, you know, Allison, the other thing that I, you know, for me as a parent and why my children are older, I just can't fathom that uh, if this were to pass, that, and, and again, my children are older, but if they were younger, if they were minors, that they could do things like get an abortion as as late as uh, nine months. They could start uh, undergoing therapy for uh, you know, uh, from reproductive issues and, and transgender and, and all that without me knowing as a parent or out my wife and I knowing. And for me, that is just horrific. 
And, you know, I think it's very clear that one of our responsibilities uh, as parents is to to raise our children and to raise them and that it that it's an expectation and God gives us that expectation to raise them in faith and morals, but to be part of their lives. And this just takes away parents from their role of being a parent. And my gosh, I mean, I mean, I, and I just know from my vantage point, I was not a mature uh, teenager. And Lord knows um, if I was left on my own, uh, there would have been some bad things happening. And thank God my parents were there to journey with me, to help me, to support me, to guide me, and to say no, to discipline me when, you know, it was necessary mm-hmm. uh, to correct me. So, um, boy, oh boy, I just, again, we just can't stress enough from a faith perspective, from a parental perspective, and from the protection of women and youth, and of course the unborn, you have to vote no uh, on November 7th on this issue. Absolutely, Rodney. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, the way we have to approach things, especially with, you know, the 18 to 25 or 18 to 30 bracket is a little bit different because, you know, people at that age are not very often thinking about having children, right. unfortunately. Um, so talking about parental rights is not something that usually resonates very well with our young people, with our college students. But what does resonate is by pointing out the fact that if issue one passes, abusers who are trying to cover up for their crimes after they have coerced minors into, um, obviously into the trauma of rape or incest and have become impregnated by that, by that cruel act, um, would no longer be able to be held accountable for their crimes and they can continue to deceive, to cover up, to, um, they're just enabled to continue to traumatize these young girls. Um, and people don't like to hear about that. Yeah. Um, these young people are, shocked when they find out that anybody who is, or, or, you know, to use the language of the amendment itself, assisting in a, in the pregnant individual's right to reproductive freedom could no longer be prosecuted because they're not committing a crime now. They're assisting a reproductive right, which is comp- so very dangerous. Uh, we think about, you know, the, the commercial that came out recently, um, just this past weekend from the vote yes side, pointing out and exploiting that 10 year old girl who was raped and, you know, was taken into the abortion facility out of state. Um, but if this were to happen, her abuser could not be held accountable. We, we have so much work to do to hold these abusers accountable to the fullest extent of the law and then some, right? We have a lot of work to do there with enforcement, but if we don't have laws to protect these minors to begin with, it's only going to inc- continue to encourage that, that further, just the culture of abuse in our, in our society. So people are, are shocked when they hear about this. So we try to, you know, share that message as much, as much as we can. Our guest is Allison Stump, the Catholic Charity Students for Life Coordinator. Allison, um, have you been energized by seeing so many of our younger folks rallying and coming together in support of voting no on issue one? Absolutely. When people get excited, that gets me excited. Um, so of course we always want to see more and more people, you know, really take up, take up the baton and get involved with us. So if, if you're hearing this, please volunteer for as many days as we have left. Please do that. But the people who are dedicated, the people who, you know, especially even if they started out saying, I don't know if I can do this. I'm very intimidated by the idea of going to somebody's door and sharing a message with them or making a phone call. But when they, when they try, when they just give it a shot, and then they see, oh, that's not actually as bad as I thought it was going to be. And, and actually, you know what? That was kind of fun. Uh, being able to make a difference, it's very fulfilling. And it's just so inspiring to see my students who who step up to do that, have their, their minds really you know, change and have something new under their belt that they can um, use to advocate for the pre-born and their mothers. And if somebody's listening right now and they're saying, gosh, I want to help, or they have a, you know, a parent who there's, their child said, hey, you know, I want to get involved, what's the best way for them to, to find out uh, opportunities to get involved? So the best way, just which is kind of your one-stop shop, is to go to www.protectwomenohio.com. And there should be a, a button just at the top of the, the, the website there that says volunteer. And you can be automatically connected to all of our resources, um, whether that be the door knocking or phone banking or um, just a, a whole plethora of opportunities. But that's probably your best bet if you just want to find all the things that are available in your area. Awesome. And about 30 seconds left, Allison, any final words on this? I just want to say thank you to all of you guys who have been bold, even in, especially people who live in more liberal areas, liberal neighborhoods, who have been bold enough to put out that vote no sign, who have been bold enough to go and talk to that one neighbor. I'm encouraging you to keep do that, keep doing that, keep fighting. Um, 
this is not a time for cowardice. This is not a time for any sort of, of fear because everything is on the line for our state. A nation that allows for the killing of its children is a nation gone under. So please keep praying, keep advocating, and we'll see you with this victory very soon. Amen, amen. Allison, thank you for all your efforts and your great work. Uh, may God protect and, and keep you as well. Uh, we're going to head to break, but stay tuned for this week's Charity in Christ with Dr. Ben Brown. We'll be right back. Last week, I explained how religion is really hard to pin down and identify. The things that we call religious are quite different among themselves, and many things that we think of as non-religious, actually, such as nations, are very much like religions. However, early modern political thinkers took a new approach to religion that had never been seen before in human history. The approach of modernity is to try to identify and make a special category of things that are religious and faith-based, and then relegate them to the private sphere, keeping them out of the public realm. The reasons are primarily because many people in the 1600s, and some earlier, thought that the disputes and fighting between Catholics and Protestants was unresolvable and destructive. So they wanted to have countries that were free from Christian faith and didn't hold any particular faith. But you can't get rid of it altogether, they realized. The later groups, such as the Jacobins of the French Revolution, would try anyway, unsuccessfully. So religion just needs to be kept to oneself, so that countries can organize themselves publicly on the basis of reason alone. So goes the idea. This would prevent anyone from fighting about Christianity or any other religion, and thus bring peace. This worldview is broadly shared today. Religion is seen as personal, such that it shouldn't influence public schools, public funding, or our laws. But such a view is only possible if we can identify what counts as religion to begin with, which I've already pointed out is impossible. At least no one's done it yet. For example, why should we think that support for what is called gay marriage is purely reason-based without anything like faith behind it? And even though the equal dignity of all people is a view that has only ever been upheld by Christianity, why should we think of that simply as a matter of natural law? In addition to being undefinable... Religion is also inseparable from the rest of life. One's worldview affects everything one does. It's not like my religion is just something I do in church. Economics, education, relationships, healthcare, and so on are all deeply influenced by my worldview, which substantially determines how I prioritize my affairs, what I buy and sell, what I eat, whom I spend time with, how I raise my kids, including their education, how I treat the environment, and so on. That's fine, one might say. Your religion can influence everything in your life that you want, if that's what you believe. But that just goes to support the idea that religion is a private matter, doesn't it? But notice that it also influences, for example, how I vote. On both candidates and laws, and how I try to influence our representatives to vote. And notice, too, that what applies to every person's faith applies also to our judges and legislators, whose views about what the law means and what is good and wise policy are deeply intertwined with their big-picture worldview, so much so that they're not even aware of it themselves oftentimes. It affects their views of freedom, justice, human dignity, what's worth fighting for, and whether and how we should take care of the poor, along with a thousand other ideas. And we inevitably end up having to make laws that take sides on religious issues. A classic example is the problem of blood transfusions for children of Jehovah's Witness parents. Their faith teaches that the biblical prohibition against consuming blood applies also to injecting blood directly into the circulatory system. For adults, we have said that they can certainly refuse any treatment they object to. But when the life of a child is on the line, courts have intervened to require the transfusion against their faith. Thus, we have taken a position essentially as a national policy that the Jehovah's Witness faith is wrong about blood transfusions. This is just one example of the broader principle that worldview and faith impacts everything and cannot be neatly separated out into some imaginary private realm. Of course, there are important truths and values behind the move to sequester faith. For example, there really is a distinction between faith and reason, and in the moral realm between divine law and natural law. However, the distinction mustn't become a separation, and in many ways the two are deeply intertwined. We also don't want to be engaged in violence unnecessarily, and fighting over religion seems counterproductive at best. Whether creating a special category out of and then privatizing religion is the best solution is debatable. But something has to be done, it seems, to ensure peace and stability. John Courtney Murray, the architect of the Second Vatican Council's 
document on religious liberty, argued that the American experiment took exactly that approach, treating religion as a public good, but because of irreconcilable views, refusing to take a public stance for the sake of peace. He called them articles of peace. Interestingly, the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution applied only at the federal level, whereas several states continued for decades to officially recognize Christianity, or some version thereof, as the true faith, as has been the case worldwide for most of human history. We'll continue with this very important topic next time. Meanwhile, that is this week's Charity in Christ. I'm Dr. Ben Brown, Professor of Theology at Lourdes University. Experience the incredible story of the woman who Time Magazine named the most influential Catholic woman in the United States. Born Rita Rizzo, the future mother Angelica grew up in a rough neighborhood in Canton, Ohio. Young Rita experienced abandonment, rejection, and heartache, but God touched her through a woman named Rhoda Wise. Encounter this amazing woman at the Mother Angelica Museum. Plan your visit today at motherangelicamuseum.com. Now, back to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster, Executive Director of Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo. Welcome back to Faith Alive. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, Executive Director for Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Toledo. And you've heard so far Kevin Jory, the Director for the Office for Life and Justice at Catholic Charities, Allison Stump, who's the Catholic Charity Students for Life Director, and now we bring in a heavyweight, and not, I mean, I don't mean that literally, <laughs> Savannah Martin, who's the executive director for the Bella Vita Network, uh, which includes the Toledo Pregnancy Center, Soul Purpose, and the Haven, and she is also uh, heads up the Ohio Coalition, Coalition of Pregnancy Centers. Savannah, welcome to Faith Alive. A lot of passion and a little body. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. There's always passion there and love and joy, and, and of course, as uh, you know, uh, you are one of uh, Bishop Thomas's favorite um, uh, evangelical <laughs> Protestant sisters the out there doing the president work. President of his <laughs> Protestant fan club, <laughs> and he always loves having you and seeing you uh, when what you a guys. What great champion for the cause. Well, let's talk about this cause. Yeah. Uh, November seventh, the vote for issue one. From your perspective, uh, what do you see in this vote? How important is it? What have you been doing as part of your efforts to help get the word out and make sure, first of all, people vote, but then also see the the clarity of what this amendment is about? Absolutely. Thanks, Rodney. So the first you know, thing that right out of the gate that was important to me is that we don't need this constitutional amendment for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons that we don't need this is that we have incredible pro-life pregnancy centers across the state of Ohio that are doing work to help women choose life and to choose it abundantly uh, from being able to house women to getting them into medical care, uh, providing child care, um, millions of dollars of material needs items. One of our very own pregnancy center directors, Melanie Miller, who is also a state representative, was able to introduce a bill uh, this session that actually removed all tax from mm. items that families need, like diapers, strollers, car seats. And so, you know, add to the list of, you know, reasons that we've already heard today why we don't need this. There are 123 pregnancy centers in the state of Ohio, and their doors are open uh, this morning and every other morning to make sure that men and women who are facing an unintended pregnancy have, you know, the resources that they need. One of the things that I would add is, you know, the every time we look at a piece of legislation, the way that I like to explain it is that every word is like a door. And it's not just a word, but that word opens a door to a lot of possibilities. Uh, and, you know, when we look at this amendment, one of the things that is the most concerning to me is that there is words in this uh, proposed constitutional amendment that could potentially down the road jeopardize the work that pregnancy centers are doing. Mm. That we see that the state will not um, pose any sort of burden on a woman who is seeking, quote unquote, reproductive health care yeah. or a.k.a. abortion. And we see in states all across the country right now, like California, Illinois, Connecticut, and so on and so on, where they're using very similar legislation to either restrict or in California outright shut down 
pregnancy centers. Oh, the my. attorney general in California just last week uh, released an open letter that just outright um, blames pregnancy centers for irrevocable harm <sighs> done to pregnant women. You know, and so I would urge people to join me in voting no. Uh, in seven days or before, get out there and vote early yes. if you haven't, um, to not only protect women, mothers and fathers and their unborn children, but to protect your local pregnancy center as well. Our guest is Savannah Martin, who's the executive director for the Bella Vita Network here in Toledo. And Savannah, I, I want you to share, I mean, what, what you've been doing and your involvement in caring for mothers and fathers uh, in your work uh, but also, as you shared, I mean, because I think so many times we don't hear that or people don't want to hear that when somebody is pregnant and somebody's in need or in, if they're feeling like they don't have a father that will support them or they don't have the financial uh, ability to support them, we come front and center to yeah. help them share with the audience what we do. Absolutely. Well, you know, I appreciate that. But, you know, the reality is, is that the incredible 123 pregnancy centers that are across the state of Ohio can't do what they do every single day without listeners. I know mm. that so many people that are listening to this show are financial supporters, they're volunteers, they're praying. Um, and we just consider ourselves lucky to see the blessing mm. of that work every single day. A couple weeks ago, we got a phone call from a young minor um, so minor on the young end, mm -hmm. and she had bought the abortion pill online. And being a young minor, um, she misread the label for the abortion pill, and she waited well past when she should have to take the the second set of pills. And when she called the pregnancy center, she was presenting with signs of sepsis. Oh boy! Um, you know that this is this is the harm that legislation like this uh, does, that it opens up the ability for children in our community to make adult decisions. And many of the women who walk through the doors of the pregnancy centers across the state of Ohio, they're doing so not because, and, and, and the ones that are considering abortion, they're doing so not because they believe that abortion is their best option. They're doing so because they believe it's their only mm. option. And that's the great lie of choice. Yeah. There was a study done in 2015 that cited just that. They polled uh, women who had had abortions and 49% of those women said, I did not choose abortion because it was my best choice. I chose it because it was my only choice. And so we like to joke that we're the most pro-choice organization <laughs> in town because when people walk through the doors of the pregnancy center, what they're getting is choice. And when women, mothers have choice, they choose to carry and parent their children. And I'm proud of the work that pregnancy centers across Ohio are doing. You know, and I would just encourage our listeners to, again, if they have not already, to vote no um, on issue one. Uh, you know, I've, I've certainly done my part, but I want to um, just give a special shout out to my dad. My dad lives in uh, within the diocese in a smaller community. And because he lives in a smaller community, uh, it's a tighter knit community. Um, and my dad, probably a month and a half ago, went and door knocked on 100 doors oh, bless his heart. Um, with signs and encouraged people to put vote no signs in their yard. And he came upon one house and the wife was um, kind of hesitant. And my dad, you know, articulated everything that he knew about issue one. He shared about, you know, the pregnancy center that his daughter runs about two hours away. Um, and they ended up putting a sign in their yard while well, someone across the street put a very large uh, vote yes sign mm. <laughs> in their yard. And this guy, this uh, husband to this wife, went and had his own giant vote no <laughs> sign printed. And that only happened because, uh, you know, my dad had the courage to go and door knock a 100 homes. And I, I remember talking to him right after I did it. And I mm. said, Dad, that had to have taken a lot of courage to go and to knock on the door. Abortion is, you know, a, a controversial 
uh, topic and you knew a lot of these people. And this is what my dad said. He said it did take courage, but now is the hour for courage. Mm -hmm. You're listening to Faith Alive and our guest is Savannah Martin, the executive director for the Bella Vita Network. And Savannah, I think that is just a beautiful, beautiful story. And of course, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. (laughs) And um, you having the courage in your work to uh, step up on this really important issue that's uh, coming next week, Tuesday. Um, How has it been for you? And I know you head up the coalition. Um, How has it been for you to see so many people come together because of this? Yeah, I am so proud of the state of Ohio, regardless of what the outcome is. um, You know, our motto in Ohio is that with God, all things are possible. Mm. And so I am confident that our miracle working God is going to do a miracle next week. But regardless of the outcome, I could not be more proud of Ohio. You know, we looked at Michigan and Far, they got they got on board far too late, yeah. and um, that cannot be said about Ohio. I I have watched people open up their their checkbooks, empty their time. Um, I have seen um, faith leaders, you know, whether it's um, Bishop Daniel Thomas um, or you know all of our incredible um, evangelical pastors here in Toledo that have stepped into the pulpit and boldly proclaimed the truth about life um, and have taken a stance. I see churches that have vote no signs in their yard, and so again, I believe that um, you know what we've done is eternal work. Mm. And regardless of what the outcome is on Tuesday, none of that returns void. I think there's a synergy in the life movement that we're just going to continue to see the culture of life advance in our great state. You're listening to Faith Alive, and our guest is uh, Executive Director Savannah Martin, who heads up the Bella Vita Network. Savannah, we got about a minute and a half left. What is it you want to convey to the audience of uh, just, you know, as you head out, for this vote that's coming up. Absolutely. Just text five people and encourage them to vote um, no with you and spend the next seven days on your knees praying that God would do a miracle because in Ohio, with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. And just share a little bit about some of the things that you're doing and if they want to get involved yeah. uh, in the pregnancy uh, center or in any of your ministries, how can they do that? Yeah, please. Um, you can go to our website. It's bellavitanetwork.org. You can read all about the ministry and the incredible work that we're doing. And we would love to have you a part. And just real quickly, I know you've got a joint project with Mom's House. Just we got a couple, you know, 20 seconds on that, what you're doing. And again, if people want to get involved in that as well. Yeah. So I would just say stay tuned. We're working out all of the details, but come right after the first of the year, you're going to be hearing incredible things and talk about the pro abundant life um, culture on the move. We're so excited to continue to keep this community updated and looking forward for more updates after the first of the year. Awesome. Savannah, thank you so much for all your work, for your spirit, your enthusiasm, your love for the Lord in carrying this message forward in everything you do. You are a bright light in our community, and we're blessed to have you. This is an incredible community to serve in. I can't imagine doing anything else in any other community. Love Toledo and love the work that I get to do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Savannah. God bless you and protect you and Ryan and all the work that you do. We're going to head to break. We'll be right back. Welcome to Catechism for Today with Father Nicholas Weibel. Lessons for daily life from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Years ago, I heard a parable of a man in hell who prayed earnestly to be released from torment. At last the voice said, Rescue will come. And the carrot held by a slender thread was let down, and he was told to grasp it. He did so, and seemingly thin through the thread was, he began to draw him up. But others, seeing his ascent, seized upon his asbestos garments that they also might be rescued. The man kicked him off, crying, The thread will break. And break it did, alas. And again the voice spoke. The thread was strong enough to save both you and your brothers, but it was not strong enough to save you alone. And what does the Catechism say about this? Paragraph 1035. The teaching of the Church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. 
Immediately after death, the souls of those who die in a state of mortal sin descend into hell, where they suffer the punishment of hell, eternal fire. The chief punishment of hell is eternal separation from God, in whom alone man can possess the life and happiness for which he was created and for which he longs. Paragraph 1037 God predestines no one to go to hell. For this, a willful turning away from God in mortal sin is necessary, and persistence in it until the end. In the Eucharistic liturgy and in the daily prayers of our faithful, the Church implores the mercy of God, who does not want only to perish, but all to come to repentance. If today you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. Now, back to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster, Executive Director of Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Toledo. Welcome back to Faith Alive. I'm your host, Rodney Schuster, Executive Director for Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Toledo. Um, This show was dedicated to Issue 1, which is coming forward uh, next Tuesday, which is November 7th. And as you heard from Kevin Jory and Allison Stump and Savannah Martin, uh, this is critical for us to get out and vote and to vote no. This threatens women. This threatens the unborn up to potentially nine months uh, of pregnancy. This threatens parents and their responsibility to help educate and form their children takes away their responsibilities and their rights as parents. So, folks, um, you know, as you've heard from Bishop Thomas, as you heard on today's program, as you've heard from others, please, 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 we encourage you to read the amendment on Issue 1, and I think you'll see the truth. And uh, please, you know, watch the video that Bishop Thomas put together on this as he actually took out language in this amendment to expose the, the the truths of what this could be, how devastating it could be uh, for our state, uh, again, for women, children, parents. So um, please, if, if you're considering voting and maybe saying, well, I'd really please get out and vote no on Issue 1, November 7th. Um, and please reach out to folks that you know and share with them. Please get out and vote. If you need resources, go to the the Diocese of Toledo website. Go to Catholic Charities website. There are resources there that you can trust and you can look at to discern the truth of what this is about and the potential ramifications. So once again, November 7th, vote no on Issue 1 to support life, to support parents, uh, to support the unborn and mothers especially, as we do uh, in the Catholic Church always. Thank you so much for listening to Faith Alive. Until next week, God bless. You've been listening to Faith Alive with Rodney Schuster. For more information about Catholic Charities programs and services, visit catholiccharitiesnwo.org. You can listen to this and other episodes anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio mobile app and at AnnunciationRadio.com.